several reasons. One is if you just uh, think about Adivasi areas in general, there is not as much literature as there should be. Uh, even if you look at Dalit writing, for instance, there's a lot more of that than there is uh, writings by Adivasis about their lives. There's almost nothing that I can think of. Uh, so there's that whole black hole in Indian writing as such, right? Uh, there is some academic, I mean, quite a lot of academic literature, but again, it's not uh, commensurate with the issues and what the problem is and so on. Uh, secondly, I think uh, this whole conflict, uh, when it started about 10 years ago, it was really, really neglected, so media coverage was absent. Uh, so, you know, people were just not interested in this area. So there was no writing and what interest there was, was on the Maoists. So, you know, because it's sort of glamorous to talk about guys with guns and uh, mm -hmm. all of that. So the books that have come out have been on the Maoists. And uh, now there has been a lot more sort of human rights reporting. But um, I think, you know, there generally just isn't that much work on conflict, books on conflict, as there should be given how much conflict there is in India across the regions. Even Kashmir, we're only now beginning to see, um, you know, works coming out. Um, if you think of the conflict in Manipur, which has been going on for years, there's nothing really. No, absolutely. I mean, there's a huge sea change in the coverage of Bastar now compared to 10 years ago or, you know, even seven, eight years ago. Uh, but the problem now, and I talk about this in the book, is that even when something gets reported front page, even when it's like mass rapes which are being reported, uh, the government just feels it can write it out. They know that public outrage isn't going to last, that anyways nobody cares about Adivasi areas. So it's just the sort of level of impunity that has become so high that you don't even care if something is reported. So, I mean, that's in a way almost more frustrating than not having it reported at all. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, in terms of the first part of what you were saying, uh, how the media itself is sometimes a participant in war, right? And we see that with certain kinds of TV channels, the kind of jingoism they uh, want to whip up. Uh, I mean, that's the whole aim of the exercise, right? And uh, I think. You know, I'm not saying that the media should work actively for peace. They are entitled to work for peace or war or whatever they want. But I think they, their duty is to report facts objectively. And people who are, you know, whipping up passions without looking at the facts, that's just not journalism. That's yes. something else. Yes. Uh, that's warmongering. Yes. So I don't even call that journalism. Mm -hmm. right? So in terms of what um, objective, honest journalism can do, I think one is it should keep its focus on the story and also go back. I mean, we have in general very little memory and accountability in the media. So, you know, an incident happens 10 years. So if you take, for instance, even Kerlanji, right? Yes. Now it's not, there are only a couple of places which are reporting it in the context of this current Maratha agitation. So there's no going back, placing stories in a larger context. Uh, and just to give you another example, right? On the one hand, Every three years, and I talk about this as well, the Home Minister says, you know, Mao's problem will be over in two years. Nobody goes back and says, well, now it's been like six years and it's not over, so on what basis were you saying that? What is, is there perhaps a better approach? And it's really what um, has been called an accountability gap. That there's nobody calling you to account for things that you've said in the past, bringing them up, placing it in context. And I think that's what the media really needs to do. Okay. So, for instance, in Bastar, we've had uh, in 2011, there was this massive attack on three villages, that Metla and uh, Morpali and Timapuram, you know, Swami Agnivesh was attacked. But the case has been going on, you know, the media is not asking, well, what's happened to that? What's, what is the CBI been doing? So there have to be periodic follow-ups. You can't just keep reporting new incidents without also following up the old ones. Yes. No, yeah, yeah, absolutely, there is that numbing effect and I think that's why it was so sad that in the early years of the conflict in Bastar, when there was still a chance that we could have had peace talks, that we could have had, you know, the kind of exposure that you have now was just not there. So when, at a period when it could have made much more of a difference, yes. uh, it wasn't there and now it's performing this numbing effect, right? Yes. 
uh, but I think one of the ways perhaps to get around that is to also do stories around other things that are not happening in the area that are not being reported but continue to happen like for instance trafficking of women which is happening on a large scale uh, but nobody's talking because the conflict and the violence is the nutritional problems the you know even the disappearance of things like uh, the kotuls or traditional uh, madais, the way they're getting commercialized, or the disappearance of these beautiful pillars, the memorial stones. Uh, so, you know, there are just so many other stories, languages, cultures, which are disappearing and not getting reported because conflict is the only thing that symbolizes the place now. Uh, in the first chapter, actually, I talk about how there's this circulating prose of uh, counterinsurgency and circulating hard, I mean, techniques uh, that are used wherever, you know, the government is engaged in this kind of conflict. So whether it's uh, the kind of regrouping that was practiced in Mizoram and then was brought in uh, through in Salvajadun people being moved to camps or, as you mentioned, Dekwanis and so on being um, translated as SPOs. Uh, and then now again being translated back as SPOs in Kashmir, yes, yes, right? Yes. So there is that kind of circulation. But what is, I think, different about each area is its own history, um, the way people organize, the way people, uh, you know, the reasons why they're fighting. So, you know, clearly the reasons why people are fighting in Kashmir um, for azadi or self-determination or autonomy or whatever is different from what they're fighting for in Bastar, which is about control over their resources, Jal Jungle Jameen. Um, uh, it's different, again, from Manipur. And also you see quite a lot of differences in how people organize. So because um, one of the really tragic things about Bastar is just that people are not allowed in. There's very little access uh, and all the main roads are dominated by the police and by outsiders, right? So they don't let anybody into the villages. Whereas in Kashmir and Manipur, it's much easier in a sense because uh, A, they have middle class Manipuris, Kashmiris, which you don't have so much in Bastar, you know, among the... So, and in Manipur, for instance, every time there's an encounter, you have a joint action committee. So here also, you have people, you know, if men are picked up or etc then all the women will go to the police station and protest so it's the same form of protest by the entire village when something happens but it just takes on different forms mm. and the reasons why people fight are also different uh, yes and no i mean in the sense that the naxal movement is much long in this area as well as generally is much older than the history of mining, right? Mm. So they yes. didn't come yes. to Bastar and they didn't become popular because people were worried about mining. Yes. And there are many places in the country where people are able to protest about mining without the Maoists being present, right? Yes. So I think too easy a conflation of the mining and Maoist issue yes. is not very useful. Yes. Um, secondly, if you look at where the Judum spread um, and even now the areas of maximum conflict, they're not necessarily the areas with mining, yes, um, yes. there are areas which are Maoist strongholds. Yes. So uh, at the same time there are areas which have mining but no Maoists yes. where also you have CRPF yes. camps, yes. right? So it's for both reasons. It's yes. mining to sort of ensure a safe path for capital and mines. It's yes. also to get rid of the Maoists uh, because they are opposing a threat to Maoists, I mean to the mining and to get rid of the Maoists in and of themselves because they uh, are, you know, taking up Adivasi rights. I think one is because A, the Maas have been entrenched in this area for a very long time and the real, I think the main reason why they're so popular is because they carried out land distribution and uh, redistribution within the villages on a large scale. Mm -hmm. So whatever else I've seen, um, you know, whether sometimes they've built collective ponds, whatever, but land mm -hmm. is like really, really basic to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so people are really defending that um, that redistribution, that uh, principle of people having land, yes, uh, yes. you know, sometimes forest land earlier in the 80s being reclaimed, yes. and 
so there is something real to defend yes. and there is a long history of involvement so the party is really part of their life in many ways Firstly, if you can't see that you're doing anything wrong, that's a huge problem, right? I mean, that's. Uh, I mean, if you think that the solution to people's hunger is sending in security camps every five kilometers, and the only employment you're providing is in the paramilitary or in the SPOs or surrendered, you know, making surrendered Nexalites into a district reserve group, that's a huge problem because yes. people want schools, they want health, yes. and you're not providing that. You know the amount of money that they're spending on security forces they could spend on getting teachers and uh, health workers and all in a mass scale, and um, you know so there's just like a complete blindness in terms of what people want and what the government is doing, mm -hmm. and building roads is, I mean less than one percent of the people there have cycles. There are there's very little public transport. Even if I mean what are people going to do with these six lane highways? I mean. They walk everywhere they're going. They walk 50, 60 kilometers uh, to get rations. You're not providing the rations. You're not providing the health centers. So what are they walking to and for? I mean, on, and anyways, they're all walking. They don't need six-lane highways to walk. So it's completely misplaced sense of priorities. Um, you know, at a time when people are really starving, there is severe, severe malnutrition. It's across the country. Adivasis have a body mass. 49% of Adivasi women have a body mass index of less than 18.5, which is actually just starvation level, right? So that you don't care about. And instead you're spending crores and crores on arming CRPF and recruiting people into paramilitary forces. See, this it's really a messed up situation uh, because if you look at what happened before the Judum started, across you know, there were teachers who went to schools, teachers who were absconding and kept getting their salaries, etc. But the Maoists never stopped school teachers and in some places they actually sort of demanded that school teachers come and teach, right? I mean, not as much as they should have, but a few places. So teachers were never under threat. But when the Judum started in 2005, the government ordered all the school teachers to come and live in the Judum camps and shut down all the schools in the interiors. So people have actually been asking for their schools to be brought back, for primary schools to be started in every village. And there would be full cooperation if that happened, you know. But the government is just uh, instead has started this policy of porter cabins, which are situated next to CRPF camps. And they want to like bring in all these children from surrounding villages in a way to keep them away from their families, which are considered Naxalite supporters. So it's basically kind of abduction of the children into government controlled schools, right? Instead of yeah. following the RT, which is a primary school for every village. Secondly, uh, they are, it's true that because now the teachers have got used to living in camp and not teaching, etc., they don't want to go back. After all, you know, they're happy and comfortable living in these things. So there is perhaps that problem, but one is that the government can just insist that they go back and do their duty or stop paying them. Secondly, uh, there are many, many unemployed youth. So if you can take unemployed youth into the DRG or SPOs, you can surely, even those with 12th class MA degrees, if you look at the number of people who apply for Shiksha Karmi jobs, I mean, there are thousands and lakhs of students who are, I mean, of educated youth. So why not employ local youth, etc. in teaching? If you take it seriously, you know, there are villages which have had no schooling for 10 years. And when... Um, Kartam Joga, you know, who is a CPI activist and one of the petitioners of the Supreme Court was arrested in 2010 by Mr. Kaluri. So he was actually engaged. He had a list of schools which needed to be restarted. He had gone to contact, talk to the panchayat people. And these are the kind of people you harass, people who want schools to come back, health centers to come back. So I'm really not sure that the government is sincere when it says that it wants to start services. And the other problem is that... Um, you know, why should the police or CRPF be handing out medicines? There are health centers. This is, it's really part of their civic action program to make the uh, paramilitaries popular. It's not about providing health, right? Mm -hmm. Because then you provide the health through the normal uh, mechanisms, your Anganwadi workers or your uh, Mitanins, your uh, PHCs, etc. 
and the other thing is if you're so concerned about health then why stop the msf and icrc from operating there these are people who are neutral who are not taking sides between the mouse and the and it's a, they are international organizations with experience in neutrality so you know how can you in an area of such great need stop people who are freely offering their services i think that's really criminal well a what let's unpack what they think they're fighting against right in terms of this ideology so what is this ideology one is the ideology that everybody should have land everybody should have you know work collectively so that's not an ideology which is illegal in fact it's highly constitutional right so you can say you're fighting against violence or the belief that armed struggle is the way to carry out this equality in which case uh, there are many violent i mean as a government you're fully entitled to fight against uh, anybody who illegally takes up arms right but in that case you should be even handed to take up arms against uh, the bajrangal or etc who are arming other kinds of communal forces so you can't uh, allow you know armed salvajdo members or samajik ekta manch people to take act, uh, violent actions on their own and say that you know one other lot is not going to be allowed so you government cannot selectively support violence yes. it cannot selectively outsource violence and if you think that equality or um, you know the kinds of things that people believe in when they join the maoists are wrong then you should say we want a different constitution um, you know i haven't i'm not a human rights activist i'm just like i mean the reason why i uh uh I mean, I've been there in Bastar before. All these CRPF men came in, and they don't have any take out on the place to say that they. So, you know, to me, it's as much part of my life, my family, as anything else, right? Because I've known people for so long, and I went there to do my PhD in the early nineties, like what, twenty six years ago now. Uh, so, I think, uh, you know. I can understand the CRPF feeling sad. I I write about that also. How there are two kinds of CRPF people. There are those who really hate the villagers there. They hate being there and they want to like kill anybody that they can find. And there's another lot which sort of recognizes the futility of this war. And it's really sad because they're also joined it for a job. They're far away. They're like vulnerable. And you feel really sad that you know this senseless war is drawing. people on both sides who are dying for nothing when this is such a easily re- resolvable dispute in a sense if the government only followed the constitution i mean we're not asking for very much right yes and both sides need not die uh and i think many people in the crpf recognize that it's a senseless war yeah. but that's their job see there are uh I guess the reason why you have the Maoists in the first place is because they fulfilled a real need, right? In the sense that people needed land, they needed somebody to fight for them against the Tendupatta Thekadars to raise the rates. So, so all of that, if the government had actually uh, fulfilled the principles of the fifth schedule, you know, really done what they were supposed to do as a government, then you wouldn't need the Maoists because officially there are policies for that. uh in terms of where it's going right now i think there are two alternatives the one is that the government will just continue to continue this war kill as many people as it can in fake encounters or real encounters mostly fake i suspect uh and just tire people out over a period of years so that you know it's a sort of punjab model right or sri lanka model where you can have massive death then human rights violations and that's it and then you can go about not fulfilling any of the promises of the constitution either so that's a kind of triumphalist war model the other thing which would be far more sensible far cheaper for the government far less costly in terms of people's lives is to have peace talks to actually implement the provisions of the constitution ah uh, 
I don't know, they're just like so many uh, memories of what people have done or said, but um, I, 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 I mean, actually, not from this period of conflict, but just earlier when I was living in the village in 91, I remember just like we went to a waterfall, um, just like the whole, like all the village youth and I, we'd gone for this picnic and I was scared climbing down the waterfall and, you know, somebody actually just putting their feet as a ladder for me to go, you know, so people are just so caring and gentle or even in the middle of this whole conflict going to a village and there's an old woman sitting there and, you know, there are gunshots next door we just heard and we are terrified and she like gives us some dried mango to eat. It's just people are so generous and so, um, you know, strong that it really, really humbles you. Uh, when you think of how they're coping. Uh, I think uh, my husband is just like he's had more more buster than he can cope with. It's not mm -hmm. lack of I mean the time is not the issue because he's equally busy doing other things but it's just like enough you know but I mean they're all very patient so. Mm -hmm.